Hello and welcome everyone to Pathfinder Friday's Beyond Magic Items. I'm Mark Seifter, the design manager here at Paizo. I'm Luis Loza. I am a developer for Pathfinder. So today we're going to be talking about ways to go beyond the magic items from the core rulebook, most of which are found in the Game Master Guide. I can say most of which because, well, there might be something else if you stay uh, tuned. Um, these include variations on magic items, even building your own magic items. So let's get started uh, by talking about magic item quirks. Now, I brought Luis on here because he's the one who wrote the quirks and the artifacts for yeah. us, which is a significant portion of the topics that we're going to be covering today. So we have a cool little intro to imagine this is a nice little slideshow that we have. Yes. In, 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 this in, is treasure. This is treasure. This is all the magic items, and there's more beyond the whole big pile that you see there. Right. And I guess the first thing we're going to look at, as you mentioned, are the item quirks. If we go to this next picture here, which aren't exactly magic items, but it's kind of where we start with making things more interesting. It is and beyond magic items. Beyond magic items, yeah. <laughs> uh, so item quirks are just funny little quirks little characteristics uh little abilities that you can attach to any item whether it's magic or not if you find just a random rusty long sword it might still have a quirk like this that may feel magical but it is actually magical and those vary from little things like maybe the sword can talk to you and tell you stories or it's always it always stays nearby because it really likes you in particular or um when you're holding it, your voice goes down an octave and things like that. They what just... is your favorite one as the Oof. creator of the quirks? I am particularly a fan of the one that sings to narrate everything that you're doing. Oh, yes. Uh, so that one's pretty fun. And one of the the grosser ones that I kind of am fond of is the one that starts sweating as you <laughs> use it more, as if it's like getting overworked so the more you swing this you know sir, sword for example it'll it's start just sweating a lot like it's being overworked <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can see how that one can lead to um some possibly um gross places yeah please. it's gross they're, they're, <laughs> these these quirks range from gross to silly to kind of interesting and some of them Actually, I, I think are great potentials. There's for... the clumsy item that when you leave it alone, it just starts knocking yes, things over. It is a house cat. <laughs> uh, I think some of these actually even lead into potentials for like fun stories that you can tell as a GM. Uh, if there's one that has like an an ancient language that no one knows anymore in it, and it has things to say but you can't understand it, it becomes its own little quest of like figuring out a way to communicate with this and right. figuring out what it's trying to say. And you know, obviously, by the end of it, it's like, don't forget to drink your oval tea. <laughs> like in like in Futurama, where they were able to translate any language but into a long dead language, and it turned out to be French. Sacre bleu. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's quirks, and that's just something that you can do to make it not just a plus one sword because. Mm -hmm. You can have it there to be a chance of a quirk and just roll on this table of quirks or is, choose, make I, up some new quirks. I think the first fully zero to, or one to 100 D percentile chart that we have in second edition. I think that has all 100 That has all 100 on entries. It, because so. the, well, the um, Rod of Wonder did not have 100 yeah. different things that was so, on it. So that was fun to do. There we go. And, and copy fitting it so that it would actually fit was not <laughs> fun to do and involved um, sacrificing some of Luis's descriptions and certain lines to make them save a line on the table. But thanks to a lot of help from Sonia, who was doing the art on this, we yeah. managed to fit it in a spread. <laughs> yeah. So if we uh, take a look at our next section, which is also in the Game Mastery Guide, um, it kind of builds off what some of these quirks can be where, you know, you have a speaking or singing sword. It might actually be an intelligent item. That's right. Intelligent items are sort of their own extra character who happens to be an item. And we wanted to make sure with intelligent items before, it's sometimes been a bit wishy-washy, but this description makes it clear. Like, this is a sentient being mm -hmm. that is along with you. It's not just, like, the character's sort of, like, slave that just does whatever they say. It's a sentient item that... Um, so instead of talking about owners um, mm -hmm. for the item, we talk about the partner of the intelligent mm -hmm. item. And the items have their own agency. They do certain things that they want to do. And um, I think all three of the example items in here are pretty funny. 
We have the genius diadem, which is an intellect headband that believes that its intelligence is far superior to your own, and it is actually <laughs> yep. um and um you can sometimes like get it to help you out more than it would expect to by playing on its arrogance to use deception to trick it into just giving you more information because it's trying to make you smarter by getting you to figure things out yourself mm -hmm. um then there's the martyr shield which is imbued with the compassion of a champion of a righteous deity like iomide or vildeus who sacrificed themselves and it protects your allies with the shield warden feet, whether you want it to or not. Yep. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't use your reaction, but um, even if you're like, no, I want my shield to not break, it's like, no, you can't no. let your ally yep. die. And then the singing sword, which uh, Louis referred to right away, it, it sings all the time. It's It can inspire courage or inspire defense you. Mm -hmm. Like, that's really good. On the other hand, it's it sings all, all the, the time. time. <laughs> and if you, you can get it to shut up for a short while by like convincing it, like, listen, we're sneaking right now. But if you do that all the time, it just gets angrier and angrier. Yeah, so uh, and this section, if you look at it in the, the Game Mastery Guide, also gives you some guidelines to, to follow for uh, creating your own intelligent items, because obviously we never have enough page count to give as many of these items as we want. Uh, That's right. And yeah, we, we hope that these these three intelligent items here and then the guidelines we give are enough for yep. most GMs to work with. The and, guidelines and, are like most of the space. Yeah. In the GMG, it was a lot of the philosophy was sort of like to teach the GM to fish rather than just giving some fish so that yep. you can make what's right for your game. Because these three are just fun enough, you might want mm -hmm. to insert them, but usually the intelligent item that you need for your story is pretty specific. Yeah, it's gotta be its own specific character, and we never know what that might be for every GM, so we'd rather yeah. give you the tools you need to make that. It That's why be, it's even in the tools section. Right, yeah. it might be Serithiel, who is in a different section that yeah. we will get to eventually, but not next. Well, what is next? Let's look at the next the picture. Cursed here. items. Ooh, There's our yikes. bag of devouring, yikes. one of the most iconic of cursed items. Although, as of this um, stream being um, recorded, the actual cursed item that has caused two separate people on the message <laughs> board just to just say, because of that item, this is the best book ever, is the yeah. bag of weasels, which is a bag that you can put your stuff in there, but when you take it out, there's a 50% chance that it turns into a weasel as you're doing so. Yep. And then you have to go chase down the weasel to get back your item. This is an item created by Jason Bowman for Glass Cannon Stream, <laughs> and then Eleanor, who was writing the Cursed Item section, uh, really wanted to put it in, so we did, and apparently can't, it is a major favorite. Can't say no to that. Uh, I was even earlier today trying to convince the organized play team to make sure they can get the bag of weasels into a adventure somewhere here. <laughs> Maybe there's a villain that just has a bag of weasels that's full of rocks that creates more weasels and throws them out there. Uh, but what other uh, cool cursed items do we have? So here? we have other specific items like the boots of dancing that mm -hmm. make you dance or um, the gloves of carelessness that's like a glove of storing. But the problem is that it only cares about the, the mm -hmm. items that are in the glove of storing and anything else you try to pick up. It's like, nah, forget about that. Yeah. Um, the monkey's paw is a classic, which was a, an artifact in first edition, but I think it was it, actually both both it cursed was and an artifact. Twice, wow. once as a cursed item and once as an artifact wow. with different abilities. Wow, there you go. Do you know which books? <laughs> um, one was Ultimate Equipment had and the, the artifact other was version. Called Adventures. There you go. Um, so um, there are also item curses, which are kind of like the bad version of runes that you mm -hmm. can just put onto your item to make the item do something funny like the grandstanding uh curse on a weapon makes it so that as soon as you drop an enemy you just do these like crowd pleasing rah, rah, wrestler <laughs> moves uh for the rest of your turn and you lose all of your other actions as you like gloat and grandstand with the rest of your turn uh which kind of reminds me of one of the item quirks i threw in which is the flaunting quirk where every like time you use the item you have to do it with big panache and, and a dramatic flair so i think mm -hmm. combining those together just means like well i guess i don't adventure anymore and i just am a big a dramatic actor <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like there's other smaller curses like the staining curse which for example um changes um anything that you are using it on to a different color so you could have a set of yellow staining lock picks that just keeps changing the locks yellow as you're using it, yeah. which could almost become a calling card for your thief. It's like yeah. the yellow bandit struck again. All of the locks <laughs> in our house are yellow. 
So that's pretty much where we went with cursed items. There's some rules about removing and identifying them to make sure that you can curse up a storm in your game with yeah, your own cursed if, items. If you're looking to make your own, you kind of just kind of get to have fun and do whatever you want with those um, yep. for the most part. That, they, they don't have a cost. Nope. They just so, have a level yeah. because you generally make them by accident. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if we move on to our next section, this is, I think, our Relics. biggest section in terms of items here. It is our longest section and also one of the um, maybe most anticipated within Paizo because of the fact that uh, when I was talking about relics on No Direction uh, interview that you mm -hmm. can check out on on their stream, um, they were talking about, oh yeah, it's great that um, you guys decided to really quickly take that very late Pathfinder First Edition relic <laughs> thing and put it into Pathfinder Second yep. Edition. But as it turns out, like Jason Bowman wrote up the a an earlier version of these relic rules trying to get them in the pathfinder playtest and mm -hmm. that's what led to us having relics at the end of pathfinder first edition because we had them from that and yeah. so the war for the crown relics that logan wrote were based on knowing what the relic rules were looking towards being in the playtest didn't fit in the playtest because it was long and it required a lot of design mm -hmm. didn't fit in the final core rule book because it was long and it required a lot of design but here we are in the game mastery guide and we've got relics um and James Case helped contribute some of the rest of the relics. Logan finished out what Jason started, and I did a so pass on these. For the people who maybe didn't check out those relics in War for the Crown, or maybe need a 2E, and yeah. obviously we didn't see them in the playtest or, or in the court rulebook. These rule are book. scaling what? items. Scaling items. So it could be from your, your father's sword. It could just be mm -hmm. something from the story, which it is in War for the Crown. Mm -hmm. They're an item that starts out one way, and as you level up, it gains new abilities. Cool. So it um, it's really simple to make them. You just start with a um, a seed of an item, which could even just be this long sword. Yeah. And then you pick um, certain aspects, such as air or beast. Those are the first two alphabetically, so you can imagine a griffin, um, a griffin sword that has air and beast. Sure. And then you pick gifts from those two categories to add on to the item. So the griffin sword might gain propelling wings that give you griffin wings, and it might gain um, feral claws. Feral claws that give you griffin claws, yeah. or call of the wild to summon griffins. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically just how it works. And you can, of course, make your own gifts if you have something that's more fitting for that particular PC, but if you don't have time for that or just want to do it like on the fly or very simply, there are a ton yeah. of basic types of um, relic that you can find in the book. There's so many categories. There's, I mean, all the different elemental stuff, air, fire, uh, water, or stuff like that, but also we have like shadow and mind and then stuff based around fiends and celestial. So there's lots of cool stuff. What would you say is one of your favorite gifts among all of these here? Uh, let's see. Because I know one of my favorites is in the shadow group, the dancing shadow. Uh, basically, if it's part of a, a weapon, it, it has to be for that particular gift. You can activate it, and your shadow will grab the weapon and fight on your behalf and keep fighting with that weapon oh, so yeah so it makes the shadow of the weapon <laughs> detach from the weapon itself and just fight yeah which is i think pretty cool it's kind of like a dancing weapon but it's just more interesting to imagine a shadow grabbing onto it and keep fighting that one's pretty cool mind has an interesting not invisibility on it where mm -hmm. you just sort of filter your own presence out of the minds of uh nearby creatures so if they don't make their will save, they're like, oh, no, yeah, there's nobody there. But it's not invisibility, so seeing invisibility doesn't help. Yeah. You're just, just not seeing the person. Yeah, just unaware of me. So there's 10 pages of gifts for all these relics. So there's lots of people, lots for people to work with, which is pretty exciting. Yep. And then I'm sure people online are going to start posting their own new gifts, either for these categories mm -hmm. or... A brand new category that someone comes up with where if they're like, well, weasels should be a category of <laughs> gifts. And then there's someone will make minor, major, and grand gifts for weasels. Yeah, great. I look forward to that. that that's yeah, that's going to be great. I, in case I need it for the weasel item that turns out to be the bag of weasels, but they think it's a weasel <laughs> relic. <laughs> All right, so if we go on to our next picture, we have, I think, the other big section in this, yep. which is... Uh, 
the artifacts, as you see here. Which wrote. Yeah, it helped write those. Um, we have in the picture here one of the most iconic in, I think, fantasy RPGs forever is the uh, Sphere of Annihilation, which just, yes. uh, I think, is a very fitting name because it completely and utterly destroys anything it touches. There's two artifacts in that picture. There's also the, oh, the talisman, the, the of, the talisman of the sphere, which <laughs> is an artifact. Yeah, yeah, um, but it's basically just the other part of the sphere. It's of the remote control for the sphere of annihilation. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, I had a lot of fun getting to write these. Um, it, it's a pretty interesting thing to to work with artifacts in that, for the most part, I mean not entirely, but you can kind of throw balance out the window and just kind of come up with. Kind of more wild out there uh, abilities and ideas, uh, so we tried really hard to make sure we brought in a lot of classics. So we have things like the deck of many things and the sphere of annihilation here. But uh, where we had a chance, we also were putting in stuff that is very much Pathfinder, very much Galarian. So we have things like the horns of Miraga, which are the whispering tyrants. It's his helmet. It's his yeah. big iconic helmet. It's the, with the one big, you see on uh, the cover of Lost Omens Legends. Yeah, and uh, just. You know, he, he's been a figure for literally since before Pathfinder was created. So, like, those horns are so iconic, we got to bring him in. And then we, we got to come up with new stuff along the way. So we have uh, one of the weirder ones, I think, <laughs> which I'm actually particularly proud of, which is the Philosopher's Extractor, uh, which lets you kind of, once you defeat your, your you know, the big dragon or the troll or whatever, you can kind of smoothie. <laughs> take a piece of that creature, <laughs> run it through the extractor. It's basically a weird juicer uh, that lets you gain some of the abilities uh, from from that creature. Uh, so if you put a dragon in there, for example, you might drink up your dragon smoothie, I guess, uh, <laughs> and grow wings for a while or, or get, get its uh, breath weapon or its uh, immunity to... Uh, an elemental type, things like that. I can think of so many plots involving like different groups of creatures that find this thing. Yeah, and depending on how much of the smoothies, how many of the smoothies you're drinking, you might actually even turn into one of those creatures, which is uh, pretty great. I think it's 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 a fun time. Yep. Just coming up with all the cool abilities and also the different ways to destroy them. Yep. Uh, each of those is its own adventure or even entire campaign on its own. I mean, there, there's the classic one ring, which had a very specific destruction method, and kind of, you know, that's that's the, the same idea that we like putting forth here with the, the different artifacts. The extractor, you have to put in too many different flavors at the same time. Yeah, into and the clog it. <laughs> clog it up. Or like the essence prism that can, like, split and combine creatures into new creatures mm -hmm. that you can only destroy by forcing it to combine two incompatible demigods, although it might also result in a new divinity. There you go. It's It's... It's fun. I mean, it, I think they're always inspiring as, as a GM for like cool ideas. Even if you don't end up using the particular artifact, just the thought of, oh, maybe someone else had the artifact at one point and what has the world look like now that it's been shaped with uh, that that in mind. Uh, so we have you know, lots of classics here. Um, and yeah, Cerithiol. So there's Cerithiol. another intelligent item in here. <laughs> which is what I was going to point out. Yeah, we even have an intelligent artifact here, which is Cerithiol, the a great sword from uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne campaign uh, that... Uh, was uh, said to have been forged by Iomade, so it's got pretty divine connections there. And, and uh, before you correct us, chat, it is a great sword. It's a sword that is great. Yes. from there, it is not um, not necessarily a great sword. Depending Unless on when you change it into yes, one, it can change into a and great sword. In my game um, that I'm playing, we did change it into a great sword for yeah. um, Linda's character. So, so yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's just lots of uh, interesting stuff. So hopefully people like these and uh, can then use these as a framework for building their own artifacts in their games or, or bringing back some of the classic artifacts they like. That Plus there's some rules for a little bit for creating an artifact. Mm -hmm. And since we have the deck of many things, someday I know Peyton's going to create the desk of many things. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> looking forward to that. All right. Uh, moving on, we have a, a brief section on uh, just gems, gems and, art and art objects. objects yes. Which is, it's a section that is just, it's similar to what you would expect from any game that gives you advice about gems and art objects. Mm -hmm. But I know that, like, since the playtest, I said that Jason was passionate about getting relics in. Steven was very passionate about gems and gem cutting section. Yeah. And so we got in this gem section uh, based on based on his notes. And then the art objects, I, I did mention this in no direction, but... Making the art objects was deceptively like the hardest time-consuming task 
for how much of a page it fills that I yeah. had to do because I didn't want it to just be the same ones from Pathfinder First Edition. But it was really important that like the items be disparate, but also worth about the same amount as each other, so that you wouldn't look at the ingredients and are like, "Wow, this gold and ruby thing is like way less expensive than this other thing." What's mm -hmm. going on? So it it actually hopefully will be helpful for GMs who are rolling yes. a lot of art objects. Yeah, not all of the tools here for that are beyond magic items are meant to just be big grandiose things like artifacts or or, or the uh, relics but you know sometimes as a gm you might just need to spice up a, a treasure hoard and i, I have 100 yeah. gold and i can just give out 100 gold pieces or i can say that it's you know a, a life-size sculpture that resembles a, a local hero or something right. and suddenly that's just more interesting sometimes you want to hand out a tankard owned by caden kalian or a crystallized dragon heart or the thought lens of made out of astral essence yeah yeah so like you do spice things up here and there just make make things more interesting it's a fun little table and i know a lot of gms just have fun rolling percentiles and generating treasure so this is kind of a callback to that yep. uh and I think we have so one more section in, in we this do. Beyond Magic it, Items. It is a very important section. It is also a very long section. So we've talked about the different kinds of items you can find mm -hmm. in the book. But now let's talk about the Building Items section. Everything we've done up till now was roughly in order. This Building Items section is first, but we're putting it here at near or nearer to the, um, the mid portion of the stream because of the fact that after we tell you about it, we're wow. going to put our... I guess not money, but our crafting of item ability where our mouth is and make a magic <laughs> item. So the building item section is based on the idea that you can build a magic item more easily from the top down. If you start knowing the item's concept and role mm -hmm. and what level you want it to be for your game. Yeah. So what does it do? Why is it cool? Why did you make it? Like there, there, there could be a reason. Like maybe you made it because... You have this one player who's playing like a bard who's multiclassed into druid, and mm -hmm. there's not really that many magic items that is exactly in their alley. Or and maybe you, they want a, a musical instrument they can use while they're transformed into an animal. Or yeah, yeah maybe one something that like, like that. affects animals or yeah. something like that. Lots like of they can play the lyre and make their animal companion do something. Yeah. So once you know why you're making it and what the concept of the item is, and then you set the level, which is usually going to be like. Around Close the to level. the level of your group. Mm -hmm. um, you can start from there to figure out the item. Um, it's a little different than Pathfinder 1st Edition where there were just sort of some quadratic formulas that mm -hmm. could tell you things like true strike at all times is worth 2,000 <laughs> gold pieces um, and then usually had to drastically be changed, but even then you didn't get a perfect sense of like when and where this fit mm -hmm. into the game. It was more of a, I've made it for utility items all too often. You made it. It cost like a huge amount because you followed those formulas yeah. and then your PCs didn't buy it or sold it back in town. Yeah, the old creation rules very much try to make a science out of item creation when we realize, I think, more that it's an art. And I, the, these guidelines here, I think, do a really great job of walking you through that process and understanding like, oh, well, sometimes even though it might not feel powerful or might not be worth you know, something in particular value. There's actually a lot more to consider than just, oh, is it this exact ability? Okay, and then it does this and that. So. We make the art into a little more of a science so it's easier yeah. to so it's easier for someone to do without having to learn to be an artist. Exactly. But uh, that's sort of what the section is. You start with that concept, then you take a look at what effects the item is gonna mm -hmm. have. Uh, because basically what you what you're going to have for your item's effects are either certain sort of bonuses or other fundamental effects that are part of the game that are very well known what level that they come in at and there's a table telling yeah. you what level those come in at or you're going to have creative abilities that mm -hmm. you can just add on that do something weird and different is not just oh plus one to ac and so with those um, we basically give you advice and pointers think mm -hmm. about your ability compare to maybe spells and um, you can benchmark if it's once per day, then um, and let's say it literally exactly cast haste. Yep. You would know that that item is probably at least seventh level because um, the benchmark is take the lowest level that um, a wizard could have or another spellcaster could have cast that spell and add two. And yep. that's a, probably about the level of once per day. item. doesn't mean that's all it can do. It can do more. Yeah. Uh, but that's... And it probably should do something else. Uh, but it's just a scroll of haste. <laughs> or a wand. Or a wand, yeah. <laughs> um, but 
you also have to think about what spell it is. If it's mm -hmm. like a whole day long spell, you're essentially just giving it all the time. So mm -hmm. then you might as well make it an item that's all the time. All this advice is in here, as well as specific advice for every category of items, from ammunition all the way to worn items, yep. A through W, plus numbers to help you figure out the magic items DCs and the price of your item based on the item's level and its function in the game. Yeah, lots of useful information. I think uh, once you've read through this section, even just if you don't plan to make something that has a price, if you're just wanting to give it away to a player, like just understanding uh, all of this would be pretty helpful uh, for, for GMs in the long run. And then maybe even uh, people who want to go and create their own stuff and sell it as third party or even Paizo freelancers might uh, enjoy it. Anybody all, could all, use this all the section. useful information here. I know I learned a bit when I was reading through it because there's always more to learn. I certainly had this section open when I was looking through the items in the advanced player's mm -hmm. guide because it's very helpful. Yeah. So let's prove it. Yeah, let's get the let's audience to help us out, our so, viewers here. Give us, we said we we're going to start with a concept. Yeah. Right? That's the first thing we start with. So pitch some concepts in the chat, mm -hmm. and I will pick one that I think we can actually make on the stream. Yeah. And we will determine the level and the comparison and, and figure it out. Um, might have helped if we brought a core rule book. Oh, but there's one behind us if we a need a core rule book. What do we need that for? To, to find the right level of spell that we need and things ah, like this. That's a good point. Um, well, we could make right. a Necronomicon. That sounds more like All an right. artifact. At so that point. the concepts so far have been a dinosaur fort, mm -hmm. a Necronomicon, a belt that makes you big, a belt that makes you big, an enlarged belt, a big belt, a a, a periapt of hunting, which I'm not sure what the concept of that is. I guess it is a an item that is for hunting. You can always work with that even. Something attuned to a type of creature that lets you listen through the ears of that kind of creature. Mm, so you can like hear what all the birds hear. Yes, an eavesdropping um, by a creature type. Magic Python. <laughs> Magic Python, perfect for the, extinction curse. The classic Eye of Robes. Which is in the uh, core rule book, I think, right? The Eye of Robes? Is oh, not the Eye of Robes. Sorry, excuse me. The Robe of Eyes. I, I, I've i heard Eye of Robes so many times yes. since last PaizoCon that I just <laughs> assume that's a thing we already have. <laughs> Gem that in lets you inhale powder. Oh, a lot of people want the Eye of Robes. Eye of Robes. Hmm. All right. And then there's Lasso of Truth. I think we have to do the Eye of Robes because so many people ask for it. I guess we have to do it. Uh, All right. Oof. Now, so now we have a lot of pressure. <laughs> so let's make the eye of robes. Well, we got to figure out what an eye of robes even. So does I'm gonna first. assume it's a held item eye. Okay. okay. And what it does is that it basically lets you um, sort of you send your sight into this eye, mm -hmm. and it basically puts you into sort of you know the um, the old uh, memory palace spell or thought palace spell that lets mm -hmm. you go into a library in your head. Yeah, yeah. This takes you into a fashion um, shop <laughs> in your head and lets you try on outfits and robes um, until uh, uh, you find which one looks the most fabulous. So and it's uh, the uh, extra planar pocket dimension of fashion, <laughs> the makeover dimension. And then when you've picked one, it can change your outfit to look like that. So Do and maybe you even like it actually gives you a robe. fill it up with outfits in advance so you have kind of what you need. You have your wardrobe on the fly. That's right. Cool. And, and then I think there could be a greater version mm -hmm. that um, if we can – actually, I might want the core robe for this. If there are any robes that are actually low level, steal this. we could have a greater version that lets you possibly like gain some of the lesser effects of low level robes that you change into. Oh, yeah. You can kind because of it's got different kinds of robes. The power from other the robes. eye of robes. Ooh. So that's quite what, a, do you, what do you think? That sounds cool. It sounds like it's a mid-level to higher-level item at that yeah, point. Yeah, no, all the robes are really high-level. We So we probably can't The greater it. version is probably an artifact that just like, oh, robe of dark magi, robe of eyes, sure, whatever. But we can still do the one. Uh, no, I, I think we got a way we can do that. Oh. Um, if it's, if, let's assume the greater version is like 20th level. Or okay. so the highest level we could have without it being an artifact. And maybe it has a one-time use. You can convert it into any of the other magical robes, but then you're stuck with that oh, robe. Oh, yeah. So you have your last change of yeah, clothes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's the final change. And it looks, but except for the, the, it looks like the change that you made it. Yeah. So it's like, it could be up to a 19th level robe, like the Great Robe of the Archmage Eye. Yep. 
but it looks exactly like you imagined it. Yeah, that works yeah, yeah. for for the awesome. for the greater version. So, so let's say we we start with the the regular, the standard, or the lesser. Is there okay. going to be two or three versions of this? Let's make two versions. Two versions. So, so that just means a standard that we'll just, and a regular. The and a standard greater. version that we just call the Eye of Robes, and then the, we can have the greater Eye of Robes. All and, right. Um, and sounds... Everyone who who actually knows how to do the names of those can can come find me and hunt me down if I'm wrong and it's not standard and greater because I never remember <laughs> but I don't think we, I think we would just be eye of robes and then greater eye of robes yeah um, and you don't write standard in yeah. that case I believe I'm pretty sure um so all right greater it's probably the so 20th level greater is item. the 20th level item that can turn into any robe of 19th level mm -hmm. or lo or lower mm -hmm. as that as its sort of final um final move final wardrobe change but the the lesser eye of robes um, so it's going to change the way your outfit looks. Mm -hmm. Kind so, of like a disguise. Yeah, so if you have a um, sort of a illusory disguise on yourself mm -hmm. is a first level spell. But this can let you change it a lot of times. But that it's only your, only your outfit. Mm -hmm. And very importantly, lets you go in and envision um, I, what your outfit's going to look like. I assume it also comes with accessories like rings and all the jewelry that a noble would have. I think so that you can could make pass sense. off as a... As a noble. So I feel like it's limited because you can't like change yourself into a dwarf or an mm -hmm. elf or something like that. It's but it's usable a lot of times. Yep. And um it gives you the fashion ability to look into it. So it's probably somewhere in like the level um somewhere in the level three range. Okay. For an item. Wow, that's that's quite a gulf between third level and then a twentieth level version. Well, it is the eye of <laughs> All right. Uh, how often could we use it then? So normally we would give you a full on illusory disguise mm -hmm. for that whole time period where you're you're like an elf now in beggar's mm -hmm. uh, outfit or something like that um, once a day mm -hmm. in a third level item and maybe something else on that same item. This is only doing this thing yep. and it only is doing your outfit. So yep. we're let's just say you can always you can do it at will at will. But. It's not particularly fast for infiltrating because it always takes at least some time going into the like sort of the mind palace stall where you're changing your so robes. Maybe so maybe you can use it at will, but it always takes ten minutes or a minute. Or to just say a minute. A yeah, minute it's change. a minute activation where you go through several mm -hmm. outfits and you get the coloring and everything exactly right. All right, one minute of activation. What does it look like when we uh, are doing that change? Do we? So we're holding this eye. We're just kind of stuck there meditating or something. And I think that what happens is like the the sort of the iris of the eye sort of changes colors towards some of the colors that we're using in the robe a little bit, and it shifts around as we're as we're changing things. Okay. Uh, would we require any kind of role like for a uh, check to disguise ourselves or anything, or is it just it's always going to be what we imagine? It's, it's always it's what gonna... we imagine, and okay. so it would mean that um, when it's done, it's done the part of impersonate that. It requires an outfit change, mm -hmm. so it's it's helped with part of your impersonation. Yeah, you still gotta do. You still have other the, things that you probably yeah, need to do. The personality and the walking and the talking. Right, and also, if you are impersonating a dwarf and mm -hmm. you're an elf, like it's not helping you there. Yeah. All right, so maybe so that's the uh, standard version of it. Right, maybe. There is a spot here in the middle between third and twentieth level for it to do some extra stuff. Um, maybe it grants yeah. you uh, some knowledge based on what outfit you're wearing. If you decide to wear a noble's outfit, maybe you get some nobility lore uh, uh -huh. bonuses, or maybe you get um, if you're wearing a carpenter's lore, you get carpentry lore stuff like that. Who knows? Maybe that could be a spot. Oh, in the I middle. see. I see about that. To, so to better, uh, let's say then that better stick to that disguise. Yeah, so let's say then that uh, let me let me look through this quickly without like falling over and messing everything up. <laughs> um, that there is a version at let's see, so eleven, twelve. There's a version at let's say level eleven. Eleven level. It has once per day prying eye. Prying eye. Ooh. Where you send the eye out to scout around because you sure. Got because uh, that's a fifth level spell, mm -hmm. ninth level wizard, eleventh level would do the once per day okay. pi eye, and since it's above level nine, mm -hmm. um, which the book says means we could put a plus two on, uh, then it gives plus two for, to um, an associated lore check that's associated with the type of of outfit that you cool. change yourself into. Well, as long as you're still holding the eye, once cool. you've changed yourself into that outfit, so, yeah. 
use your idea on that. Or probably is still in your possession. Yes. Maybe you don't want to be walking around as a noble with a weird large eye. Well, it's a held item, though, so... Mm, that's hmm. true. It, held items, because they don't take your... Um, they Because of the fact that they're not worn and they don't take any of your investiture, they, they need to be held to get their so benefits. Maybe so maybe when, when you put on your outfit, it also transforms to an accessory that you have to hold into your item, like a scepter for if you're pretending to be a king. Or a book if you're pretending to be a there librarian. You there you go. And then um, the greater version can have a plus three on Ooh, that item bonus. Can it do more than prying eye at that it point? It can do at will prying eye like the robe of ice. Um, <laughs> at will prying eye. Uh, and then one time. You can change it into any robe of 19th level or lower. Ooh. Does that <laughs> Does that include... The robe of ice. Rare robes and uncommon robes. Oh, well... Um, this is, it, it probably should be one you know, your character knows about, but all of the robes are rare or uncommon. No, that's so, true. Well, let's just say it changes into either a robe of eyes or any other robe that you have access to. Okay. So even if you don't have access to robe of eyes, you can still get it to be I the assume, robe of eyes. I assume what happens is the uh, eye, of, eye of robes that you hold then splits into all the eyes that become the robe itself. Also, honestly, the greater version is level 20, so let's give it you plus three perception from the eyes. Plus three perception. Scouting this, just Great. like the robe of eyes. There has. we go. So, sounds like we have three versions of our eye of robes here. We have a lesser eye of robes at around third level that, at will, if you spend a minute, lets you change your clothes. Yep. Great, cool, awesome. awesome so, what thing. does it cost? Uh, a third level out. item, yeah, let's see. A permanent is 45 to 60. This is sort of in the vanity section for the mm -hmm. most part, so let's put it closer to the 45. Okay, so we'll say 50 gold. Just a nice, yeah, 50 nice gold. even number. 50 gold. And, all, right. all right, what about the 11th the level The 11th version? level item, the one that lets us cast Prying Eye once a day, gives us a plus two bonus to a particular lore, like for whatever yep. you're disguising as, and yep. still lets you change your clothes That's with pretty one good. minute activation. But it's still probably closer to the lower end of, uh, of the 11th level range yeah, because it's so. not like... Casting a cone of cold and um, giving you the perception bonus you got. Yeah. So let's do maybe 1,250. What do you think? Or one, do you think 1,200? 1,250 sounds good. It's another okay. nice number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. And then for the 20th level item. The one that gives yeah. you a lot of bonuses. It plus three perception. Lets you do prying eye at will. A plus three bonus to your lore. Change your clothes. And whenever you want, swap it out for uh, a robe. One time, you can right. transform it into any other magical robe. So clearly, since it could transform into a magic robe that is up to 40,000 gold pieces mm -hmm. in value, like, it's not going to gain value when it turns into yeah. the robe. So you're not, you can't sell it for more money than you would pay for it. So. And perception items start appearing at level 17 when mm -hmm. they're probably a pretty prime item. But by now, that's it's been a few old levels. News. It's a little bit old news. So I think... We could probably get away with 55. Yeah, 55, I was thinking the same 000. thing. I know it's it's very close to the bottom end, and we're doing a lot of things, but this is a 20th level item, and it's not doing that much for a 20th level item. And plus, we've got a lot of 50s in here, so... Yeah, it's it's on theme. All right. 55. So there we go. We Great. have now created the Eye of Robes. There, people can... Uh, and we have not only created one Eye of Robes in about 15 minutes, we have created lesser, three versions of the Eye of the Robes. the greater version. So. Also... Yeah, we don't need a DC for any of these effects, but we could assign that pretty easily with this section, too. Yeah. Let's yep. make sure we followed the advice for held items, because I didn't actually read it here. It says, make sure, imagine the PC physically using the item, what that looks like. You you had us do that. Yep, we were looking, and the iris is changing colors. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, they're more challenging for martial characters to use compared to spellcasters or hands-free characters like monks. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, but you, we're mostly using it outside of combat anyway yeah. um, to yes. do our... Fashion. It's more of a social kind of intrigue style item yeah. than it is a combat focused item. So. Absolutely. We could have it change into like a fashionable cane and just yep. walk around. It's All like, right. Cool. I like how that turned out. So what do people think about the Eye of Robes? Yeah. So anyone who's listening can jot these stats down and introduce Speaking it to their of a their fashionable game. cane, it's Ooh, actually canes. something else. Yeah. When are we going to get canes that I can fight with? You mean like a sword cane? A sword cane. Yeah. Well... Um, Peyton sort of trailed off in his um, Twitter statement, but it turns out we're gonna get we're going even more beyond magic Ooh. items because we've got some advanced players guide magic item stuff in here. What? But only if Chad wants to hear about it. And they probably don't, uh, right? I, so, I'm sure they all want to run and play with the because uh, we robes. just talked about so much game mastery guide stuff. Yeah. So 
Uh, does anyone want to hear about a little bit about some of the magic items and other items that are in the um, the advanced player's guide, such as the sword cane and whether it's in there? Uh, it looks like some people... There's uh, exclamation marks from Ular mm, Warlord. That probably means that they don't want to hear about it. Because they're so they're excited, so about, the excited about the Eye of Robes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it looks like they do. So let, let's... What do you have for us today? Here's what Mark. I've got. And, um, yeah, I can put this core robot back. put this core robot back. So not only do we have the Sword Cane in the Advanced Player's Guide, but we have the Claw Blade, which is like claws coming out through between your fingers. What? Um, Ooh. Uh, the Kakara, which is like, you know, that staff that the monks like tap and it's got all these things on top mm -hmm. that like make a clanky sound. Oh, like the uh, iconic oracle has. Uh, yeah, like that Ooh. one. The Tengu Gale Blade, which is just like really cool item that doesn't really exist. So it's hard to describe it's it. Fantasy. But it's like, it cool can stuff. be used. It's like almost like a fan and a sword. The Wakizashi. The bola, which you'll recognize from also Lost Omens, Gods, and Magic, is yeah. in here too. Mm -hmm. uh, and the DiQ. Wow. So we have, well, th those are all weapons that are coming in APG? Yes. And, th and then here's three magic items that are going to be in APG that were chosen. One from each of um, me, Logan, and Liz for um, some magic items we like that Liz wrote for the Advanced Player's Guide. So... Mm -hmm. The walking cauldron is a first level item. It is a cauldron. It walks. It can carry ingredients in itself. It'll follow you around. If you try to put things it doesn't like inside of it or overload it, it gets mad and will just stand still like in a fit for about 10 minutes before it will follow you again. Cauldrons have rights too, so I get that. <laughs> uh, there's also the exploding shield. Have you ever thought that some of these specific shields don't have enough hit points or hardness? Well, this one intentionally has the least possible because when it is completely destroyed, you could trigger it to explode in a giant explosion damaging your enemies. Ooh, so you want it to break. Yes, and it's actually, even though it's like sort of a permanent item, it's mm. its price is 25 gold or something like that, which if you look at the cost of items for its level is in the consumable range mm. because it's intended it is to be definitely used. consumable because you're just going to blow it up on stuff. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, the four ways dog slicer. It's have you ever like had your character, maybe a goblin, who is like, ah, I want flaming, but I also want frost, or I also want shocking. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, uh, the creator of this item figured out a way to give you all three of those. All you have to do is touch the extremely dangerous gems that are full of the elements of those three types of things. Damaging yourself, and you can change it out for whichever of those three you need as a single action. <laughs> I'm sure it'll work great. Actually, it will because of the weaknesses on certain monsters. Yeah, and if you're a char hide goblin, maybe turning on the fire is not a big deal. Right. And what's the fourth way? Well, that's if you want to wink them all out. That won't damage you, which yeah. for some people might be a downside to that particular activation. Not as fun. Of it. So, yeah, those are three of uh, those are just. A small taste of uh, things to come in the events players guide, but this stream is mostly about the game mastery guide, so we weren't going to put very much. But those are magic items from beyond. They are very beyond, and <laughs> some of them are weapons that are beyond. Yeah, they're so, from, from beyond even the GMG. So. I think it's time for our final part, where we're going to take questions from the audience. Ooh, yeah, we have some time. We'd like to, yeah. to hear... Uh, we the, try to get at least questions. 15 minutes for that, and we sometimes fail. We sometimes <laughs> succeed. It looks like we managed to sneak all of this in here. So Yeah, all this content. Intelligent walking content. Yes, it's exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's not exactly intelligent. It, it's, it doesn't, it's not it an knows intelligent item. to know when it's upset with you. Yes, it can still get upset <laughs> with you, though. That's the best part. <laughs> all yeah. right. So, yeah, if anyone here in chat wants to throw any questions at us, uh, uh, just kind of... Potpourri free game. Oh, wait, these. here, let's see. Um, so uh, here, Lori7x3 asks, I like the idea of intelligent items, but I always felt like they're a pain to play as a player and as a GM. Any tips for using them? Hmm. Well, I would say that when it comes to using an intelligent item in your game, um, you need to think about exactly what you want the footprint of the item to be. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's not something that would be a pain to you. It can be an item that is sent, you know, sentient, but maybe not even fully sapient. Mm -hmm. More like an animal that's empathic and can be your friend um, and activate things for you, but not talk to you. Yeah. If talking is like kind of too much, just be like, 
think you could think of that kind of an item as like a loyal hound that's like with the with the PC and it'll like sense danger or do a few other things. All the way up to the item that just has a super strong personality is constantly bickering with the PC. Just like any NPC or character you're going to be adding into the game, think of your intelligent item like that. And that will let you figure out what role would fit for the intelligent item without being a pain. Yeah, the, the big thing I would say is just make sure that the intelligent item isn't slowing down adventuring. It may, the intelligent item shouldn't always be like bickering with the player or always being trying to you know throw everything off off the rails or whatever. It's 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 your tool as a GM to use whenever you like, so you can uh, you can intersperse it when when you need it. The Killing J asked, "What is your favorite intelligent item you've used in a campaign?" Do you have a favorite? Oh, I haven't used too many. I think um, I made up an intelligent item in my Legacy of Fire campaign uh, for a swashbuckler. <laughs> for mm. that was a, a rapier that was basically out there to kind of destroy the the evil genies that that the campaign kind of runs into, and basically was an ally for the party. So I thought That's that was cool. a good time. My favorite intelligent item is in a um, a three five. Uh, somewhat gestaltish game mm -hmm. that was in a far eastern setting. The Wu Gen was played by a player in my group who was kind of very shy. Um, he would always come, he'd get excited about what his character could do, but he didn't really discuss or talk as much unless it was absolutely necessary, not only in character, but even out of character. He was mostly withdrawn. So I gave uh, his character, started with a because we would played in some other games before. So mm -hmm. this character started with a book that was an intelligent book that had um, sort of like the souls of the previous owners who were his family members. It's passed on to the most promising mage in that generation. And except the rest of his family were kind of sketchy. Uh, they wanted to do magical studies for science, no matter <laughs> what. And they were killed pretty much down to him. So also the book knows that to perpetuate itself, it needs more people. So it... It wanted the character to have kids and succeed and survive and would often offer advice that was questionable enough that it wasn't just the GM <laughs> telling you the right thing to do for that situation, but it was, it was pretty smart. So um, it would at least be a conversation starter, and that player was the only one who heard what it was saying. So it would he would be like, hey, guys, um, w did you think about this? And then they would be like, whoa, wait a minute. Or, wait, that's pretty evil. Are you sure? <laughs> So that that book is my favorite intelligent item because it was a way that I discovered to engage a player more. Yeah. So. Do you mind if I share? Oh, uh, Peyton's going to share one. Yeah. I'm off camera. Sorry, fellas. But uh, I want to give credit based on the Puffin Forest. Puffin For those of you who know some of the uh, some of his animations and stuff for tabletop RPGs, which I blatantly stole one of his ideas for one of my campaigns, <laughs> which is basically a sword of warning. Okay. And this has basically created just fear in my players because they hate this sword so much. Because the sword, its entire purpose is to basically warn you. But what happens is that the sword won't tell you what happens. It'll, it'll say, like, oh, no, something dangerous is going to happen. And it's like, <laughs> what sword? What's going to happen? It's like, I don't know. But something terrible is going to happen eventually. And it's just, it'll just pipe up ever so often. And they wanted to melt. They tried melting the sword, selling off the sword. And I always made it come back to them as like a cursed item more than anything. But it was my favorite magical item that was somewhat intelligent. So. <laughs> That's great. I Let's love see. it. Kapolv asked, how can you get your players to use consumables instead of just hoard them up. The classic mm -hmm. mega elixir problem from yeah. Final Fantasy. And I'm gonna admit something, which is I am a item hoarder who does not use my consumables enough and hoards them up. And unfortunately, there is a lot of psychology into why the, these people, such as me, um, mm -hmm. hoard the items, and you're not gonna be able to get us to not hoard them, which is just why you have yeah. to consider that in game design. Like, for seriously, with hero points, we had a lot of discussions about different ways to do them that were based around, I was like, I'm a hoarder, but I want these hero points to be something that I will actually use. With the hero points, the way that that we get around that is they expire at the end of the session. Um, you So you could do something like what organized play does, where for each mission that Pathfinder Society gives you some consumables, mm -hmm. they go away at the end of the mission. 
that is probably the closest you can come to what we did with hero points it doesn't really work for most campaigns though that's for org play because you're being sent by somebody but that will get a hoarder to use the item because then they're like oh well use it or lose it i better use it for sure yeah. so um I don't think there's any way beyond that sort of meta structure to really make um, a hoarder use their item, or at least I don't know how to make me use an item other than that. So you probably can't get your hoarder to use it either. Yeah, I don't know. There's something about not wanting to use it that it overpowers any other logic I have. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, we have some other questions here. Uh, Fragile Vessel asks, I know it's not explicitly discussing the uh, GMG, um, but they're asking for advice on uh, running duet games where it's just one GM and one player. Uh, running for unusual sizes. Yeah. Um, it's it's tough to give advice for that because it, it varies a lot, especially on who the GM and player mm-hmm. are. I know that in um, in Arcade Mark, the stream that Linda and I uh, run, we had an episode on very small groups um, where we talked about it, and based on what people in the chat were saying the techniques vary a lot yeah. and uh it's hard to it's hard to pin it down because you need to know like okay is this a new player that is um what is the player into and just to quickly sum it up figure out what the player likes because that it should be what like the big focus is on in a normal game you have to compromise for what all of the different mm-hmm. people like but if this one player likes sneaking around you can be like the solid snake sneaking is like half the game and you you could never do that in a non duet yeah. game all right uh next question we got key pulls there we got uh oh. silent infinity asks uh, say you wanted to design design some sort of item to fire off something to impact your enemies at high velocity but also have your area spells go off at impact would you start with some sort of range weapon uh modified staff or more of a handheld item to me the immediate thing that comes to mind is like a specific piece of ammunition that maybe you could imbue with the spell you could have the spell strike ammo which is in the core rule book which is going to hit them and then it's going to do some kind of a spell yeah so that's the the simplest way is that we have that one Mm -hmm. but um if you want to impact them with a ranged attack that is actually doing physical damage it's probably ammo or a weapon Mm -hmm. to start off with If you're impacting them with, like, shooting a fire ray at them or something, and then it also puts a spell into the fire ray, that might be a held item that's not the same. Um, Let's see. Ular Warlord asks, what would your opinion be on level zero characters uh, for a campaign and whose main method of leveling up was actually through their relics? They'd gain more power through relics and leveling up. So that would be a very flat campaign in terms of power because ultimately level zero characters are one-shotted by most things mm-hmm. because they have not their class hit points they have like six eight or ten plus their yeah. con modifier and they will eventually lose out on uh the proficiency bonus not scaling with their level and things like that so so i think that's going to be rough unless you you know what you're doing and what you're doing is making sure that it never really scales that much up mm-hmm. on the enemies if you do that then yeah they get cool and interesting powers okay. but i think the relics are going to wind up being very disparate in how much they help depending on mm-hmm. Because they weren't balanced around that. So it's one of them that's like summon an 8th level creature. Um, or summon a 15th level monster or something like that. That's for a 20th level relic, it'd be like, that's very good. Because all of our characters are terrible. So a 15th level monster is like 100 times more powerful than anybody. Whereas one that's like, when you hit, you um, cause all these negative conditions on the monster. Might be better for most people. Mm-hmm. Then summoning a 15th level monster at level 20, but not if your character is level zero. Yeah. I could see that being a really fun one shot, mm-hmm. uh, but a whole campaign might be a Relic rough. Squad. Get relic random squad. relic <laughs> abilities like Fighter Squad. There you go. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. What other questions do we want to I think get? we may have gotten um, a lot of the questions here so far. Uh, and there's only. Uh, there's only a few more minutes, so we could probably answer like a, f- a few more questions. Oh, Lord. And then after that, well, there's all sorts of fun streams. And yeah. I'm not going to get it wrong this time because Peyton told me last week <laughs> that this week is um, Dragons and, and Things is going to be right. on. Uh, so we have another question. I don't know if this is Peyton or if he was getting someone else. Yeah, question I didn't from see Bob. it, but but uh, the question is: When creating a magic item, what balancing traps should I look out for? I think uh, the the item building items actually goes into something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
uh, it's very easy to do something like, oh, well, here's an item that casts a spell, and then using the item is just one action when the spell itself is two actions or more, and giving the, the wrong actions for activation could suddenly make things a lot more powerful than they're meant to be. Yep. Um, like, imagine an item that casts a fireball that's, like, completely appropriate for your game. Mm -hmm. Three times per day. Now imagine it was one action, so that you can cast it. Uh, all three of your actions are fireball, 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 and it's triple what is appropriate for your game. Yeah. That alpha strike is going to be a big, is a trap. Another trap is one I mentioned before, which is, Oh, the spell is only once per day, but it lasts 24 hours. So it's mm -hmm. basically constant. Yeah. Um, so know your durations, know your action activation. The, are some of the biggest traps. The, the other thing the, the guide mentions is uh, scaling out of usefulness. You could technically make an item that is balanced that lets you cast, uh, the example here is burning hands three times a day, but by the level that you're getting it, it's going to be becoming pretty useless. It's going to be doing so little damage that you might as well be using other uh, your actions for other things uh, like casting a higher level version of Burning Hands or, or other spells. So. All right, let's see. Fragile Vessel ran a one-shot where the characters leveled up every 30 minutes. Get my Fighter Squad one-shot. It's four hours, and we leveled from 1 to 13, but we did it in a very <laughs> weird way, and it was not really exactly leveling. Fragile Vessel is interested in the idea of a gaming stream that also does rapid leveling up for the Advanced Player's Guide. Well, I mean... That is interesting and challenging idea. Mm -hmm. The fact that like Peyton put it up onto a list of questions that he's collecting means that at least he hasn't immediately been like, oh, no, this is completely impossible from my end. So I don't know. That seems like it would be uh, it would be challenging, but it could be interesting. Could. Um, yeah, I don't know. It would take a lot of work and pre-planning to make sure that that's uh, going to go off. Let's smoothly. see. What rules should I follow when making a magic item? How would I restrict my players from just pawning it off at full value? Well, uh, we recommend using the building item rules from the Game Mastery Guide. Mm -hmm. And since when you sell items, you sell them for half price, by default, um, your players should not be expecting to pawn mm -hmm. it for full value. All right. Uh, Lori 7 x 3 asks, what's your favorite cursed item? Um, I mean, Mine's the bag of weasels now. <laughs> now the two people said it's the best book I've ever written because I mean, of it. <laughs> I, I don't want to also say the bag of weasels, even though I like it uh, very much. Um, I've always been a fan of uh, the monkey's paw, uh, and in particular, I have an attachment to the monkey paw in 2E, uh, just because it it's a great storytelling device, I think. Um, even though... Um, giving cursed items too often won't be like the nicest thing to do as a GM. I think the monkey's paw is just the one I would constantly have show up over and over. All right, let's let's do maybe one more and then go into our closing statements, sure. which is what in your opinion would be a bad magic item that isn't necessarily a curse. Hmm. I will give one. Uh, this is a magic item that is a real item from a published RPG and is the worst item I've ever seen because of how much it screws up your game. Okay. Here's what it does. It's it's an item that uh, once per day, mm -hmm. um, it rewinds time by one turn. Oh. And then you redo things starting from there. Yep. It is an item that ruins your game even if it's never used. And paradoxically, once it is used, your game has not ruined for the rest of that day. Why? Because you have to like keep track of everything that, could, that has happened in exactitude of exactly when it happened. Because it was also an immediate action type item that you could use at any time. Mm -hmm. So you needed to know exactly when it was one round before that a thing had happened of everything that happened so that you could rewind time by one round. So that is a bad magic item that is not a curse. In fact, it's very beneficial other than like for fun. Yeah, that is just too much bookkeeping. So. All right, so let's, uh, to finish off, uh, just as a reminder to everyone, um, next week we're going to have a stream uh, for Pathfinder Friday, that's going to be about chases and infiltration with uh, Logan and John Compton, which should be a lot of uh, a, should be a lot of fun. I yeah. think those are some very very interesting subsystems, and please stick around because um, it's going to move on into dragons and things. Unless I got yeah. it wrong again, they're back. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Things were changing. Through okay, it. we're about to go say hi to Glass Cannon for a little oh, bit. It is Glass but Cannon. Then, okay, so here's the weird thing: their times are overlapping. So we're going to go over to say hi to Glass Cannon for a bit. Okay. And then at 6 p.m., Drags and Things with a whole new premiere of their season three will be up. So if you want to stay okay. tuned for a lot of awesome Pathfinder 
second edition wow. stuff. This sounds like an evening of awesome stuff. That it's it's too much. Too <laughs> much like, content. It's, it's, it's too much. A lot much of content. amazing Our people playing a lot of awesome games. Cup so. overfloweth with and Pathfinder. Remember that when to raid, it's going to come up with a notification. And just say you're ready and let's prepare an emoji. What's or not, or not necessarily an emoji, but a statement. What magic item related? Go I have robes. I have robes. I have robes. Yes, just go in and say I have robes. <laughs> since we we actually or the, like, I have, the I have robes lives because we actually <laughs> made the I have robes or something like that. Rather but, we can just say the I have robes. See you. Oh wait, maybe like we should that. talk about bag of weasels because they'll know or, what it is at glass yeah, cannon yeah, because that'll actually that, work out because we're on the glass cannon. Because right. glass cannon played with the bag of weasels, yeah. the original one. Yeah. It's like you can just, yell, just bag yell bag of weasels in GM is in the GMG or something like that, and then yeah. glass cannon will get what you're saying. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay, with that, everybody, just say bag of weasels when you send you all over. So, Mark, Mark, Luis, thank you so much for being Thanks here. Sorry everyone. for being on camera and yelling at you. No worries. Have an excellent Friday. See you all next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.